Got it. Bingo. So we'll wait just a, a couple of more minutes uh, to give everybody a chance. Uh, okay. I'm sorry I took so long. I just, my computer just kept taking me to a place where it wanted me to download Zoom. And I'm like, I've already got Zoom, you know. So that's cool. They just didn't know how hip and technologically advanced. Absolutely. So you really happy. are. Happy birthday, Julie Watson. Thank you. Thank happy you. birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Julie. Happy birthday Thank to you. you. Thank you. Thank you. It's been a great day. I did you. That's so lovely. Hi, Hi Ray. Yeah, that's yeah, like that's uh, next level of happy, happy birthday. birthday. Sure is. It just goes to show you I'm not afraid to let people hear <laughs> if I don't sing great. <laughs> hey, Nikki. I love that. Thanks, Bev. Yeah. Hey, Teresa. Hey, Victoria. I haven't, I don't know if I've got everybody on here yet. Whoops. Well, if you go, uh, be sure you're in gallery view. And yep, I've got it now. Ah, oh, Michaela. Angela, Rebecca. Oh, who's that? And Victoria said that. So yeah, lovely to see you all. Amazing. Yeah, we are going to uh, head on. We'll just well, we'll wait two more minutes. But uh, so tell us what's going on in Australia until we get to our subject, our discussion for tonight. What's what's happening there? Well, the, it's halfway through autumn, more, three quarters of the way through autumn and fall, I should say, and um, the weather's going to be 27 degrees today, which is pretty warm. Uh, so, you know, short sleeves, etc. It's beautiful outside, sort of. You can just see the birds are singing or screeching anyway. And um, the sky's blue and um, yeah, it's just lovely. So I don't know really what, I'm trying to see if, is there enough light there? Maybe this is better. Uh, um, yeah. If there's any way you could maybe kill the window behind you or no? What I'll do no. is do this and kill this window. How about that? As you like. That would be a whole lot better. It's always one of those things, isn't it? When you yeah. you're yeah. trying to get it all worked out. So, uh, so far, yeah, Bev. Uh, Ali Peplin, all the way from Florida. Wow, Ali. Angela. Hey. Ashley Ludwig. Christopher. Amy Terry. David Bacher. Don. How are you? Uh, Julie, of course, Lloyd, uh, the Odells are on, Michaela Hooper, Nikki Hitchcock, Rebecca Bacher, Sherry Allman, Teresa Rice, and uh, Victoria Dunlap. It's great to see, or wait, no. Uh, uh, Victoria, I got the wrong last name. But anyway, we're gonna go ahead and, and, and start. So as you know, we are just facing unprecedented times and it it just changes uh, day to day. And I think uh, what I've seen in this is just kind of an, uh, in, I've been through other difficulties. I've been through 9-11, I've been through the Y2K, I've been through, uh, actually I've been through the Rodney King riots in uh, Los Angeles. Uh, some big monumental uh, events, but I, I don't think I've ever seen this level of fear and kind of irrational behavior um, just so pervasive in it. And in, in our times of talking with people, certainly kind of at the top of the list really seems to be uh, fear and anxiety and, and trying to deal with, trying to deal with those things. So, we, we definitely want to uh, talk about that. And as you guys know, uh, Bev and you know, her husband, uh, Rick, who's passed away a couple of years ago, they were our pastors. Bev still is our 
our, our pastor and we have just gleaned so much. And one of the things that we've gleaned is, is uh, to allow and the choices that we make to allow faith to shape our future rather than fear. So I get a little more people in. Uh, so, so Bev, I, you know, sometimes I think if people know you and they spend any time with you, uh, they know you're full of life and full of faith, but um, you weren't always like that. Uh, and especially maybe it, it, people would just say like, oh, well, certainly she's never had any issue with fear, but, but actually we were uh, talking, I know you a little bit, and, and actually fear was something like from a very young age that uh, really had the opportunity to have a, a big influence on your life. And I just wondered, maybe you could tell us that what did fear look like and when did it, when did it first start? So I think I was always afraid. I, I, I was always afraid. So I can remember even being three years old and lying in my bed at night when I was by myself because my big sisters didn't have to go to bed yet. And I would lay there and I would imagine myself walking down our back path and into our garage and then there would be um, all this quicksand and there was all monsters in it. And I just used to have it night after night and I would lay there by myself and I'd be terrified. I was terrified of the dark. And so, and I grew up like that. I continued to be terrified and nothing really would fix that. And I remember when I was about 11, my mum, who was actually a really kind, good mum. So what I'm going to say is going to give a different impression, but she was a good mum. Um, but she felt like I had to beat it. And so I can remember one time, well, she always used to make me go and put the milk bottles out for the milkman, which meant going down the back path and leaving them in the caddy down there. And um, she used to, and I said, Mom, I'm scared of the dark. I can't go down. And she'd say, no, it's okay. But she would come down with me. But this one day she said, no, I'm going to stand at the door. I'm going to watch you go down and I'll, you'll be safe because I'll be here. So I went tremulously down the back and put the milk bottles down. And then I turned around and I ran back up the path. And for whatever reason, I don't know, but she felt like I needed to understand there was nothing to be afraid of. So she started to shut the door on me. And so I'm on one side of the door and I've got my, you know, my shoulder against the door and I'm screaming, mum, let me in, let me in. And mum's saying, there's nothing to be afraid of. Don't worry, while she's forcing the door shut out. Side. And so there's this hysteria from me and, um, you know, that didn't help. And so I, I always had that fear. I, I never didn't have it. And so after we got married, um, if Rick was ever away, I'd have all the lights on in the house even while I slept. And then I became a Christian when I was 22 and there was something in me that thought, this isn't right. Like the whole thing, perfect love casts out all fear. And I knew my love wasn't perfect, but I knew Jesus' love was supposed to be. And so I thought, I can't give in to this. And so I began to train myself mm. to do things in the dark while Rick was there. So when I had the babies and I had to feed them, I'd get up in the night, I'd walk to their, to their rooms, get them out of their cots and take them downstairs all in the dark. And I wouldn't let myself turn the light on until I got downstairs. And I was trying to overrule fear. And I would be praying all the time, God, would you help me? Would you help me? And just gradually, I began to, uh, to deal with fear and it began to recede. And the thing that I found was when you deal with fear in one area, it re re begins to recede in other areas too. So I was quite insecure and I had a whole lot of different fears. But as I was dealing with that fear of the dark, other fears started to move back as well. And so I felt like I was winning at it. And so that was at that point. Mm -hmm. So do you, was there like any, like one big, huge, gnarly crossroads event that, you know, that you made this change and the shift or was it more of a process that took time? It was definitely a process, but the other side of it was fear doesn't want to let go easily. 
And so we'd been, you know, I'd been a Christian for a number of years, maybe 10 or 12. And Rick and I were pastoring a church by then. And I was, I had a car accident. I'd been going down a very windy mountain road and my car slipped out and I hit a truck and my car was just completely written off. And, and I felt fear come back then. But also around the same time, I came home one day and my littlest boy, who was about 18 months, had climbed out. So we had a veranda in front of our bedroom and he had climbed outside of the balustrade. I don't know how, but so Rick had been down the back and so he, and the, all the kids were around and so nobody was actually watching Seth, although everybody thought everybody else was. So he had climbed outside of the balustrade and there was a little lip about that wide and he was sitting on that little lip outside the balustrade and and if he fell it was straight onto concrete the concrete driveway and so i'm standing there trying to not be frightening to him but calling out to anybody else in the house and nobody heard me and so i had to leave him there and run up into the house and into my bedroom and you know up the stairs and then out and then lean over and get him off the balustrade and those two things just brought fear back to me so strongly. And I'd been winning the battle gradually. But at that point, I was afraid of everything. Everything made me jump. Everything that happened, you know, was just terrifying. And so I, um, I felt like, so I feel like often we get our identity out of fear. The things that we're afraid of give us our identity. And I felt like I don't want my identity to come out of fear. I want it to come out of the fact that I'm a Christian. And so I thought I've got to defeat this. And so every time I drove, I'd be afraid because of the car accident. And one time we were driving up to Queensland, Rick and I with the kids in the back, and it's about a 12 hour drive. And and, and it was dusk and Rick had gone to sleep next to me and I was driving and the tracks were all going past and my, I felt like my heart was in my throat um, and it was just hammering all the time. And I knew that all I had to do was say to Rick, can you, can you take over the driving? I'm really afraid. But I felt like if I do that, I'm giving fear. It's, I'm, I'm, I'm feeding the fear. And so... I drove my two hour stint and I didn't do it. And so gradually over the next couple of years, I won back the territory that I'd lost because of those two things. And I've continued to do that over the years. I don't really have to do it to any great degree now, but I know I don't have to do it to any great degree now because I fought some really hard battles, difficult to win. I lost some battles, but I really came to a place of winning a war of fear being my identity. Mm -hmm. yeah, so, my identity. Yeah. And how do you think, and so it, this was a process happened over time and, you know, some victories, some setbacks, it sounds like you, you were gaining some things, but then there was definitely things in, in life that can trigger us uh, yeah. towards anything. And then I think we kind of, feel like maybe we've dealt with certain things in our life and then a triggering event happens and then it's like, well, it wasn't as far from me. <laughs> I thought it was, had no part in me, but actually it was, it was there uh, somewhere. But, um, but as you began to deal with this, I think one of the things that, that really stuck out to Julie and I, uh, you know, Rick passed away, what, two, three years, three, three, three years ago. Yeah, almost, well, within a couple of weeks or three years ago. And I remember when it first started and you wrote us an email and you just, and you, and we were wondering like, Hey, how are you doing? We didn't, maybe we didn't really know exactly what to say uh, to you guys, but you said something, you said, well, she goes, you said, thankfully we've learned, uh, like we've dealt with fear in the past, we've dealt with it before now. So, so this experience really is, is a much different experience. Can you, can you tell us how having dealt with fear in your life, uh, how, how, how do you experience things uh, differently? How would the experience with going through uh, Rick's treatment and, and eventually uh, his death, how, 
how was that different because you had dealt with fear? So when Rick was diagnosed, I remember we stood outside the hospital and we just cried in each other's arms. So obviously it was a devastating diagnosis. But we didn't rehearse all the things that might happen. You know, when we did some sensible things, we, we, we updated our will and, and all that kind of thing, but we still were standing in faith and we were believing we had seen God heal before. And if you remember, Rick had a four month diagnosis. They said that he would die within the next four months, but actually he lived three years, another three years after that. And a lot of those, you know, at one point we came over to visit you guys in that and he was very well and he was very effective in what he was doing around that time. So, but um, we, we weren't telling each other again, or ourselves. We weren't, I wasn't telling my mind again and again, this might happen. He's going to die and I'm going to be left and what's going to happen with this and what. We just didn't let ourselves go down that track we continued to say, Lord, you've always supplied every need we ever had and you're going to continue to supply that. And we saw God do some real miracles in that. And we made, the, we made a full, our lives full over that point. We talked about the way that we loved each other and the things that were of value to us and all that. But we also talked about a future. We, we continued to speak about our future. Now, in the end, that future really didn't come to pass. But the alternative would have been, Rick, Rick said, um, I'm not dying, you know, I'm not, I'm not dying, you know, I'm, I'm living, I'm living until I die, you know, my, I'm going to, to be alive until I die and I'm going to walk in life, I'm going to speak life and walk in life until the day that I go to be with the Lord. And so it was the thing that, it was within the, the realm of speaking life which, you know, we've always talked about. But people sometimes go over and over everything that can go wrong. And there's nothing wrong with looking ahead and saying, okay, we need to put that in place and we need to put that in place. And, like, we did update our wills and all that kind of thing. It's not, that wasn't lack of faith. It was looking at... So when David saw the giant, he didn't say there is no giant. He just talked about the fact that the Lord was much greater than the giant. And so... That's what we did. We felt like the Lord was much greater than the giant of cancer. And so, and that's still the case. And so I know that after Rick died, a couple of people said to me, I don't really know how you can be okay. And I was like, when Rick and I were, became Christians, we made a decision. We were going to love the Lord more than we loved each other. And that was a good decision because it meant that, it meant that we were able to love each other better than we otherwise would have. But it also meant that when Rick went, the Lord was still there. And I have not felt bereft because the Lord was still there. And because I have not, and because I had dealt with those fears, even though I live in my house alone, I can walk around in the dark any amount of time. I'm never frightened and I'm never alone. Yeah, uh, that's great. So. Uh, so one of the things too that I, I mentioned before was like, it just seems, and we all know it, we all see it and all feel it, you know, this un, kind of unprecedented level of irrational behavior in fear. I mean, there's a lot of examples, but I can use toilet paper, uh, mm -hmm. buying up six months of toilet tissue, like, uh, you know, in the South, there's a big joke, well, especially in North Carolina, not kind of like the mid-Atlantic where there's two inches of snow and everybody goes out and we buy bread and milk, uh, no matter if we've ever eaten those things in the last six months or not, like we just go out and buy it. But we've never had the toilet paper thing. I've never seen people just like hoard uh, toilet tissue. And so obviously there's a, there's a spiritual thing happening here. There's uh, something at, at play. And the thing that I, that I, I love about Bev is that, you know, she, she knows the word of God, but she's also sensitive and sees kind of bigger pictures. And as far as what's happening, maybe in this, the spiritual realm, like uh, dominant spirits that are, that are uh, at play here. Can you tell us what, uh, what you see kind of in the spiritual realm? Like, where's this coming from? 
So, you know, I don't talk much about spirits of anything and mainly because I don't, you know, I don't want to focus on them, but sometimes you have to talk about it. And mm. from what I can see and have felt for a while, actually, you know, probably the last five or 10 years, I've been feeling like this, that there are two very strong spirits loose in the world everywhere in all of our nations. And one is sex. It's like the world is saturated with a focus on sex and, I, and the things on the TV. You have to make a decision. I am not going to watch this or I am not going to read that. And so there's this saturation with sex and the whole thing with porn and all that just being forced into people's phones and et cetera and people getting trapped. But the other is fear. And sometimes I've just been overwhelmed at watching the way people identify themselves by their fears, the way they embrace their fears, they have coffee with their fears, they get all their girlfriends together or all their mates together and and they all talk about the things that they're afraid of and conversation is like somebody just says, you know, can you go to the dry cleaners for me? And and the answer might be, oh no, I'm afraid not because blah, blah, blah. And like it's even got nothing to do with fear, but people, use, I don't let myself use those words except deliberately. I will never say I'm afraid not or I'm really scared this is gonna happen. I will say I'm watching this and it is a concern that this seems to be developing. I will never say I'm, I'm scared this is gonna happen because it it's like it just reinforces fear to us all the time. And so my neighbor who is not a Christian, she's about a bit older than me, and we were talking a few weeks ago and she said, I have not been panic buying. This was early in the process. But she said, then I went down to the supermarket and I saw all the bare shelves and suddenly I felt terrified. And I just thought, that is a spirit. That is not, you have it and, and you know, you haven't, you didn't go down there with that, but you saw the bare shelves and that thing just came over you which is why I feel like it's so important for Christians to say, I am not going to let myself be shaped by what I'm afraid of or what everybody else is afraid of. I will not do that. I refuse that to happen. And I think that's why it's so important to deal with it in your background with the things that you're legitimately afraid of, like, you know, like um, the dark or like not having enough money or things that legitimately rise to say, am I going to be okay? If you can deal with it there, then when a spirit is attempting to overrule your world, it won't be able to get into you mm. because you already dealt with it back there. Yeah, yeah, that's that's good. I had the same exact experience at the supermarket. Like I thought I was doing okay. I walked in this place. I saw people with their grocery carts overflowing with toilet paper. And I looked down and I saw an empty shelf and all of a sudden I probably had five panic attacks in my life and I had a panic attack. Like it was just like, Ooh. And I think like, where's the carts? I better get on the move. And I took about two steps and, and God got a hold of me. It's like, Whoa, 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 Whoa. Come on, amigo. Like, yeah, we got this. I've proven myself faithful mm -hmm. to you for 300 months in a row. And, yeah. uh, I'm going to take care of you this month too. But, you know, you, wow. I've heard you in the past, you've talked, you've spoken about, I can't remember where it was, a uh, conference or something, but you spoke about the unholy trinity. Um, what, is, what is the unholy trinity? Well, the short story is that when Adam and Eve, um, they would work in the garden in the morning and in the afternoon, their father would come and they must have waited for his footsteps and run out to meet him because they're so excited to talk to him. And it just says they used to work to get walk together in the cool of the garden. They were both actually called Adam at that stage. Eve didn't have a name till she, till they were out of the garden. So Adam, the two of them, would walk in the garden with God. And then when the woman took the apple, took whatever the fruit was, when the woman took the right to know what was good or what was evil and gave it to her husband and he chose also to decide for themselves what was good and what was evil. So previously God would have had that sorted with them, but now they wanted to know them for themselves. The first thing that happened was they looked at each other, they saw they were naked and they were ashamed. And that's to do with sex as well. But 
they saw that they were they saw they were naked and they were ashamed and they had to cover themselves up. But the second thing that happened was that they heard the sound of the footsteps of their father walking in the garden. And instead of running to him like they did every other day of their lives, they were afraid and they hid from him. And then the third thing was that because they decided to take the right to know what was right or wrong for themselves, which is like, I'm going to buy up all the toilet paper because that's going to be right for me. Because, um, because they'd taken that on their lives, then they had to leave the garden and that's rejection. And so for all of our lives, everybody is born with this unholy trinity that wants to rule their lives, shame, fear, rejection. And the only one that can deliver us from that is Jesus Christ because he took all our shame. He died for our fear. You know, he, he rose again from the dead and gave us the right to live in freedom and dealt with our rejection. And so, but I, it is only him that can deal with it. But we have to work. We have to synchronize with him. Like that thing that I said right back at the beginning, I sort of understood that if perfect love will set me free, and it says, because fear has torment, which it does. We're all tormented on the inside with fear. So like back there when I was like, I cannot live in fear if I'm saying that I trust in this God that releases me from all fear. And so it has to be an ongoing thing, shame, fear and rejection. We have to find a way to work with, to, to be at one with Jesus Christ to such a degree that shame and fear and rejection recede until they no longer have a hold on us. It doesn't mean that it doesn't rise sometimes. It does rise. I, I'm not denying that. I, it's not that I, fear hasn't, doesn't rise in me still. It's just that I know how to defeat it because I did defeat it. And I think if you remember um, one of the chapters, it might have even been the first chapter of the book that I wrote about Catalyst, is that when Jehu called out who was Jehu was going to um, was going to destroy Jezebel, and he calls up into the window, and there's these two eunuchs, and he says, "Who is with me?" And the eunuchs, who could have thrown Jezebel out of the window any day of their lives, but never did, suddenly saw that there was a deliverer, and then they threw um, Jezebel out the window, and she was killed, and then they all went on to destroy all the the evil in their land. And the thing that I understand from that is if you can throw it out the window of your own house, you can destroy it in the world around you as well. But if you cannot throw it out of your own life, you, you have no power on it in the world. Mm -hmm. Well, that's amazing too. Yeah. Cause like the, the eunuchs, like they were strong enough, big enough, like at any point in time, they could have done, they could have picked her up. <laughs> tossed her off and, and the thing would have been uh, demolished uh, yet that it, it did it took somebody calling out to them yeah. saying hey like you've got the power like you don't have to live that way uh, mm -hmm. rise up so uh, those are good things well I want to talk a little bit now kind of about the process so I we've talked about uh, kind of your journey uh, through dealing with faith, we've talked about uh, how what's what's happening on on the land and how it's you know there's definitely spiritual activity that is is that is challenging or maybe you know we have to be honest it's it's desires to have influence mm. uh, in our lives and to influence us away from our destiny in Jesus uh, away from influence us towards uh, having the peace of Christ reign and rule in, in our hearts. But, uh, so let's talk about some, some practical things of, 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 of dealing with it. And uh, uh, you related a couple of stories, but, but one was really, uh, how do you, how have you been able to build a history uh, with God that now gives you a place that you can rest your faith? So it is, it is really a building. It is really something that is a building. One of the things that I found when I was a young Christian and I was trying to stop smoking and I just couldn't and I was walking along the road and I was 
I was like, Lord, please help me stop this. And he spoke to me really clearly and said to me, the day you hate it more than you love it, you'll stop. And I, I wanted to argue because I was like, I don't love it, I hate it. But I knew what he was saying. I did love it. I did love it. And so there came a time when I hated it more than I loved it. It took me a couple of goes at it actually, but there came that time. But I, you know, I read my Bible a lot and I know that when I don't understand something the Bible says, I'll, I'll put a question mark in my Bible next to it and I'll ask the Lord to explain it to me. But one of the things I found was I needed to trust what God said better than what I trusted myself. So there would be times when I'd be afraid, for example, financially, and and I would he, I have scriptures about how God provides for you. And one of them, and my God will supply all of your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. And another scripture says, faith comes by hearing the word of God. And so I would speak that out um, Lord, you said that you'd provide all our needs according to your riches in glory by Christ Jesus. And even as I said, as I would say that, my mind would say, that is stupid. How is saying that going to make the slightest bit of difference to the fact that, you know, Rick's job is on strike and you don't get enough money on, you know, in your, 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 your money runs out before your month and, and it's just words, you know, and so there'd be this struggle and my stomach would feel sick because I'm scared that we're not going to be able to pay the mortgage. So my stomach would feel sick. My mind would be telling me that I'm stupid for thinking that just saying words, it's just a mantra and a mantra is never going to help anybody. But I had to let my spirit be stronger. I had to, I had to think the Bible says that the mind is at enmity with God, but your spirit isn't at enmity with God. And so my spirit would be instructing my mind to say the word of God and I would say it and say it and gradually over time there came this build up of times when the Lord had rescued me I mean I've had a lot of times when I rescued myself and it, and it seemed to be okay at that point and then it, it wasn't but I mean one time there was a time when I just felt like we, the children were young and I thought we're not going to have enough money to um to be able to provide for two cars. And so I I really pushed for the fact that we would sell my little car. And Rick didn't even really want to. He wasn't a Christian then, but I pushed for him to sell my little car. And then I spent the next two years with two babies going on and off buses and all that kind of thing. And then I said to the Lord, why is this the case? And the Lord made it very clear to me, you never asked me about selling your car. You just went ahead and provided for yourself. And if you'd have asked me, I would have provided. And so, so getting it wrong taught me and getting it right taught me. And both of those things taught me equally. I learned from the times when I did it myself. And, and I think that's really important. When you get it wrong, don't just blame yourself or blame everybody else or blame God. Just let God teach you. You didn't ask me. And therefore, these are the consequences, which is the the knowledge of good and evil. I thought it would be better to sell the car, but it wasn't. And so God will let me take consequences of doing it for myself. But he also taught me from that. And then he taught me other things as well. So you know the story in Joshua where they they come through um, the River Jordan and, and then God speaks to him and he says to him, get 12 stones, each tribe get 12 stones out of the middle of the river and put them on the riverbank. But most people don't know. He also says, and get 12 stones out of the riverbank and put them in the river. And then the river rushes over those 12 stones. And it's like God saying, I know you've got it wrong sometimes, but we're going to forget about that. What I want you to remember is these memories of how God brought you through. And so those 12 memory stones that um, Joshua built and he told them to tell their children and their children's children. And so I tell myself how God has provided before. I tell myself the amazing ways he's done uh, things. And sometimes even now, like I'm 68 years old, I'm still working, I'm still believing God. But, you know, I'm like everybody else. There's times when I know that I'm, I've got a need financially, for example, and I lie in bed at night and I'm like, Lord, you have never let me down. And I know you're not going to let me down this time either. And then other times when I lie in bed and I'm like, God, I cannot believe the way you provided for me. 
And, and I just lay there and I worship and tell him how grateful I am that he has never let me down. And so it's like the memory stones to remember to thank him, to remember, to remind myself about what he's done. I don't need to remind him. I just need to remind myself and then be thanking him for that. And yeah, so that. Yeah. So uh, and, and I say this as well. Yeah. The other thing is to, that I identify fear as the enemy. Yeah. I know that it is not like if somebody, if a great big green hairy monster was banging on my door trying to get in, I would see that was an enemy and I would do everything to keep that door shut and locked. I would not let it in. But for whatever reason, we find it so easy to invite fear in to all our conversations, to our conversations with our friends and with each other, people we're married to, our kids, the people at work, have a cup of coffee with our, our fear, lie down in bed with it at night and just let it go over and over and never do anything to say, this is an enemy, it's not who I am, it's not how I was made, I am not going to sleep with the enemy, I am not going to have coffee with the enemy. We don't often we don't even do anything about it and i realize you can't defeat it overnight but you have to make a you have to begin and if you begin the process with one thing you're afraid of just one thing and gradually win that battle all the other fears recede but if you give way to fear in just this one thing all the other fears increase so it's like just deal with one at a time but as you deal with that one, you're beginning to build up a store of, of strength with which to deal with the other fears as well. Exactly like you did in the supermarket, Jeff, when you, you felt the thing that's in the world, the spirit of fear in the world, and then the resources from which you've dealt with fear all the other times just rose up and was able to just put you back in the right place. Once you've been doing it and keep doing it, the, the more you do it and keep doing it, you can't even allow leeway in one area and think, well, I'll just let myself be afraid of that. No, it's got to all go back because if it all goes back, then when a spiritual force comes from the outside to land on you like it is on our world, it doesn't, um, it doesn't find a chink in your armour. Yeah, I think that's good too because we all know that triggers are going to happen and, and certainly uh, triggers are plentiful <laughs> like over the last five or six weeks. So it's, it's awesome to have. Uh, so we've got some, we're going to take some questions in a little bit uh, too. So um, I guess, so how does, can you really deal with fear in your life and with, without taking risks? No, I don't think you can really. I think, but the thing about risk and faith is that faith is risky, but sometimes people just are risky anyway and they do stupid things and God never told them to do it. So faith and obedience uh, operate together. And so then it's the, it's the process of getting to know your God because... Um, faith is a risk so then for me to if if i had done the other thing with the car and asked the lord what will i do about this car because you know now i'm not going to be working anymore because i'm having children and so can we afford this car rather than just going straight to what was obvious i think the lord would have provided and in the end when i got it right he then provided immediately like within that weekend a car but it would have been a risk it would have been a risk to say okay let's just keep the car because i feel like god is saying it'll be okay rick wasn't a christian at that stage anyway um so it would have been all on me but i think that yeah you definitely you feel like this is what god's saying so remembering to ask him like one of my favorite scriptures is proverbs um Three, five, and six, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Don't lean on your own understanding. In everything you do, acknowledge him and he will direct your path. I pray that all the time, pretty well every day of my life. I'm like, God, my own understanding is quite strong. 
And so I know I can easily default to it. And I still do sometimes, and, but I quickly realize it and I go back and repent. And so I'm like, well, what do you want me to do about this? And then he might say, I want you to go ahead and do whatever. And then I'm like, okay, that's a bit of a risk, but I'm just going to do it. And I don't feel like it's risk anymore because I know the voice of the Lord. But in real terms, it is a risk because you don't actually know what's going to happen. Yeah, I think so. So you, you took you took risks, and I think it's important to take risks because it's there that that God actually has the opportunity to show us that He is faithful, that He is protective, that He is providing, uh, that He is loving, all of those things. But if I feel like if we if we don't ever take risk, we never give Him the opportunity to prove those things. So it just kind of, that just reinforces the fear. Well, you know, since we, God hasn't proven himself personally to us, then, you know, we can, it's easy to kind of overlook that. And, and in that context, maybe being fearful makes more sense uh, than being uh, faithful. But I think what, if we take risks, they can they can just be the smallest ones and like you said maybe start off in just one part of uh life but uh i think as we take those risks as god proves himself then we build this history right. and to the point where actually being fearful doesn't make just doesn't make sense anymore yeah that's really true or staying it's staying fearful like we uh, fear is going to yeah. hit us Staying faithful or staying fearful, I guess. Because fear rises in all of us. It's a normal response. Um, you know, that I, I don't have any issue with that. It's when it's a, a foe that you've dealt with so often and with success that it, you deal with it quicker and quicker. But the risk is, for example, as far as I'm concerned, the risk is like, Hey, we've got COVID-19 out there. Um, and I know that anytime I go out, you know, it, it is a risk, but I'm, I have to go out to do the shopping or I have to go out to do my job or I have to go out for this reason. And therefore, I know that the Lord is going to protect me as I go out. But if I say, do you know what? I'm going to have a party because this, I just I can't be bothered with that, you know, then actually that is stupid risk. It's risk within the framework of what is right. So somebody might be terrified ever to go out and somebody might be like, I'm not going to pay any attention and they just go and do whatever they like. But in the middle, there's the thing that says, I'm going to do the right thing because it is right for my nation. But I know that the Lord will protect me when I do go out. It's mm -hmm. like that. So that's a risk, but it's a risk within the framework of faith. I think so. Um, let's see. So David uh, Bacher had a question. So let's let's go ahead and do this. We've got uh, 25 minutes or so. Let's go into uh, Q and A. So we've kind of touched on some some broad things. And what I heard Bev saying is like Thanksgiving is one of the the things that that she uses in in the process that she's incorporated uh, declarations. You know, we had Steve Backlund uh, out here uh, about igniting hope, and he was big on declarations, and and he definitely talked about like this this war between our spirit, uh, which uh, is is fine, and our mind, which tries to talk us out of the things that God is speaking to our our spirit, and then you talked about praying a scripture, so how important a scripture in, in prayer is, but uh, let's do this. Let's let's open it up. Uh, I was hoping, so David texted something here, uh, put a chat in. If you guys have questions, we can do that. Uh, let's see, David. Uh, are I you comfortable, are, are you comfortable, David, with, with just asking Bev and you guys just having a little dialogue for a bit? Yeah, I am. Are if you David? I, yeah, so... Let's let's try that and see how that works. If you're all right with that, David. Sure. Can you hear me? 
I can. Uh, yeah, so I guess my question was more in regards to kind of Jeff's example when when you walk into the grocery store and you you're, you're you don't have fear and then you see that aisle that has nothing on it and then you start thinking well I need to be prepared and you start kind of going into that um, that kind of mindset uh, how would you kind of separate those two I think you may have just answered the question um, but uh, you know, is it all about our motive and attitude at that point? Yeah, I think it's about attitude. Some people by nature are more prepared, more organized. Some people are less organized. It isn't really about your character. An organized person can be a very faith-filled, trusting person. So I'm not saying that planning or being organized or having a, you know, having a, Having a pack of 20 toilet rolls is not a problem, but having two packs of 20 toilet rolls is. And so I know when I go to the supermarket, I feed my wild birds out here every day and it's really important to me. But I know for the last few weeks, every time I've gone to the supermarket, there's not much bird seed, not many packets. And so I, twice, I've picked up the last two packets left and both times I've put one packet back because I'm like, I only need one packet. I'm going to trust the Lord. When I do my shopping next week, there will be another packet. And it's like, I cannot let myself go that I just have to be extra sure. And so being prepared, I think the difference between fear and being well prepared is definitely the driver because we often baptize our fears and we call them something else and we and that sort of makes it acceptable Ooh. like perfectionism well perfectionism is just fear and over planning is just fear and concern i'm just concerned that that often can be fear i mean i might use the word concern as well but sometimes people use the word concern and they actually mean i am afraid so it's the thing on the inside am i trying to protect myself and make sure that me and my family are all okay um, and therefore I'm doing the extra? Or am, I, or am I saying I'm going to take the one packet, Lord, and I'm going to, I'm one packet of pasta, one packet of chocolate biscuits, unless you go through two packets in a week, you know, and then it's two packets. But whatever you would go through in that period, that's all I'm going to pick up. So that is prepared because... Then you've got like my pantry. I've got everything I need in my pantry, but I don't have three of everything I need. And if I've got two of everything I need, that's just coincidental. I didn't do it on purpose. So that, that we're talking about food, but actually that goes into every area of our lives. It's when I know I, it's when my driving motivation is that I've got to stay safe as opposed to Lord's going to help me stay safe. There'll be food there next week. There'll be toilet rolls the week after. It's going to be okay. That's, it's always about how you feel and whether you, it's the tree, it's the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil, whether I'm going to let God supply for me or whether I think he's pretty busy up there and he doesn't know that I haven't, you know, that next week I might not have everything I need. Mm. Mm. Is that, is that a good reasonable answer? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I thought it's good stuff. Um, Anybody else have a question now is uh, your chance. Well, what about it, Bev? I mean, sometimes we become believers and we just kind of have this understanding like, you know, just that believers aren't fearful and uh, it doesn't happen. And if it does, you know, you just deny it or, you know, kind of uh, slough it off. But how, you know, how do we deal with it when we're not really, you know, just like we should never be doing things just because that's what a good Christian person does, right? Um, but what is, how would you, and you mentioned something about fear and identity, maybe like fear and destiny. So how, how are those two things really kind of intertwined? What do you, what do you mean when we, when like fear is our identity? What do you, what are you speaking to? I'm speaking to the thing that says I have to have my house in order because somebody might come and then they're going to judge me 
or I have to have this amazing car, even though I'm going way out of my depth financially to get it because people might not think I'm good enough if I don't have an amazing car or an amazing house or, um, or you know, like in some churches, people carry the big, you know, see, so you go into some of the churches, people carry the biggest Bible because everybody's going to know they're spiritual. And then you go into another church and it's all about your little Bible and, you know, that you carry in your pocket or, or you know, how many times you prophesy or, um, or whether you're married and whether you're not married and what people will think and you end up, you know, marrying the wrong person or being with the wrong person just because you're afraid people will think you're not good enough if you're not married. Or it's the thing that drives us to present a different picture, to not... To not be just me. And I think, like, I was a very insecure uh, child and teenager and woman. And so, therefore, I had a lot of issues to work out. And gradually, the Lord just got across to me, you've got to let that thing go. You've got to let that thing go. And when I let it go, um, so I think I've said to you before, I was very sarcastic and very cruel with my with my tongue and with my way of speaking about people and people would laugh when I said funny things that were cruel as well. And when the Lord was saying to me, you're not to do that anymore. This was before I really understood about speaking life, but he was saying, don't get your identity out of being that person anymore. I was afraid that if I stopped doing that, I would become a non-person and people wouldn't think I was funny and wouldn't want to be with me. Um, and yet that didn't happen. I became more me. And so now, I mean, you guys, we all laugh at the fact that I've got a really terrible voice, but I've got a singing heart and I just, something comes up and I just sing and I know how I sound. I know that. But I also know that I sound like joy, even if I don't sound beautiful, I sound like joy and I want to be a joyful person. So I am not afraid to sing badly in order to express my joy. But I never would have done that back in the day. Like I do it now because I'm, this is who I am. I'm a singer. Just because I don't have a good voice doesn't mean I'm not a singer. And so, or sometimes I will speak the truth directly, not because I don't like the other person, because I think the only way through for them is to understand. And but sometimes, so we get our sometimes we get our identity out of being what we think everybody else will like, and that's motivated by fear and motivated by rejection and shame as well. We think we're not good enough. We think people won't like us if we're normal. And the truth of it is, if you do become who you really God called you to be. And as he puts his finger on something, he says, I don't want you to tell lies anymore because you're only telling lies in order to be acceptable because you want them to believe better of you, but I don't want you to do it anymore. Now I want you to tell the truth. Then there's this massive risk because you're like, well, if I do that, therefore people won't like me or won't hire me or won't do whatever. But actually, the more like yourself you become, the freer you become. And the freer you become, the more shame and fear and rejection do not have a hold on you. It's a very difficult path to walk. And there's a lot of embarrassment in it to start with. But gradually, it's just like, this is me. And it means if people don't like you, like for me nowadays, I love me now. You know, the Bible says, um, love your neighbour as yourself. Well, sometimes I think if we loved our neighbours as ourselves, God help our neighbour, you know. But if we gradually love ourselves because all the extra bits are being peeled away from our identity and we become who God created us to be, it means we truly can love other people without judgment. We really can. And once we love other people without judgment, then if they don't, if people around don't like you, I always think to myself, well, you've missed out because I'm a really good friend. I'm a good person to have around. You know, I like me and you would have liked me too if you weren't busy defending your identity. And I think if all of us, if Christians could be that, I don't mean speaking harsh words to each other because it's the truth. I don't in any way mean that. 
because I think if you love yourself, you'll love other people and you'll find ways to bring truth to them without crushing them. So that's not what I mean. I don't mean, I don't mean, oh, well, that's just me. Take it or leave it. No, I don't mean that. I mean, letting the Lord deal with you, with your issues, running the risks that people may not like you anymore if you stop lying or if you stop having the biggest car or if you stop, you know, whatever, if you stop being cool. Um, once that's worked out in you, it enables you to build other people in who they are and help them begin to take risks in their life to be themselves as well and help them begin that process. But honestly, it's a process that takes years. I'm not saying it's quick. Yeah. Cool. Okay. That's, yeah, that's good. So you just got to get a big Bible <laughs> and sing loud no matter. So I don't know, you might be making Michaela Hooper's job tough. She's going to have all these people apply uh, for worship team. I can't sing, but you are a worshiper, Bev. I and, uh, am. That's why we've got, but I've, I've unmuted Teresa and uh, Teresa Rice, and she'd like to talk about some economics or finances. Before we do that, I just want to say yeah. one thing, and sure. that is read your Bible. Don't get one of those little books that says, this is the scripture to use in this situation, and then use that because that's a mantra. It's okay for somebody to give you a scripture and you think, okay, you know, I needed to hear that. And now, but read your own Bible for yourself and mark your own scriptures and hear what the Lord's saying to you. Because if you just get a thing that says 30 scriptures to use under these circumstances, it's just a mantra. And a mantra is not going to save anybody. Sorry, Teresa. Go ahead, Teresa. No worries. I love you, first of all. I you. <laughs> and I miss you. Um, Thank you. I, I, I don't. And I think because of you and because of the, the book that I read, um, your Speak Life book, I, I don't walk in fear. However, having said that, because of everything that's going on and you see what's happening in the nation and you you see the unemployment that's raising, I, I work in a essential business. Um, however, even in the essential business, because stock markets are falling, some of our good like huge corporate customers are shutting their jobs down so although i don't walk in fear i don't live in fear necessarily when you start hearing things like that you you get concerned and you get concerned for your nation and you get concerned for your neighbors and so um and so that's it's a it's a hard thing first of all you're working so you almost feel guilty because you're working and so many other people you love are struggling um I don't know, but it, because it's happening not just to us and to our neighbors, but really to the globe. So how do you navigate that? So uh, first of all, I know that the Lord is in charge of the world. It doesn't look like that in some places. And, and really the, the um, you know, the way it looks is quite, is quite terrible, but I know that, underneath it all the lord is in charge of the world and he it's not that he doesn't know what's happening so the first thing that you have to deal with in yourself which is part of the shame fear and rejection is a guilt that you have a job you need to turn that into thanks you need to every time guilt rises and you feel kind of awkward and i know that personality trait because i used to have it so every time that guilt rises turn it into thanksgiving, yell at the top of the, your voice, God, thank you that you've given me a job. Thank you that you're providing for me. And so, so start there because that is really vital. But then the second thing is, it's like the giant and any of us could lose our jobs. And certainly I had a lot of bookings that, you know, that disappeared because all the conferences disappeared. And I have a lot of friends in that situation as well. But the second thing about it is that um, God, people might lose their jobs. Any of us might lose our jobs. So I'm not saying that we're going to say, Lord, I know my job is safe. What we're saying is, Lord, I know that you'll provide for me no matter what happens, that you'll provide all my needs according to your riches and glory. That then is not contingent on my job. It's contingent on the Lord. 
So that's what David said when he looked at the giant. He didn't say there's no giant. He said, who are you uncircumcised Philistine to come against the armies of the living God? And he, he saw the giant as being unable to overrule. But if David hadn't been there, the giant would have overruled. So we have to be people who see the giant and see the God that's bigger than the giant. And so therefore, in terms of the people around us that are losing their jobs, there's a few things. One is, um, one is to be praying for them and to be encouraging them. And maybe you might have something that you can give them that will be their need. I know that just recent, I mean, I do try to give and I've got several things that I give to regularly, but just recently a young man with a wife and baby came into my sphere from Uganda. I don't even know the guy, but I do know that one of the things that the Lord has done is put on my heart that I need to make sure that they are okay. Now, I don't know what's happening about the rest of Uganda, but I do know that God has spoken to me about that family. And, and so, so I'm doing what I can within that context. And so then, so the second thing is we see that the world is in trouble and our neighbours in trouble, so we're praying for our neighbours. And then if, I, if, you, if we have something that they need, we can give it. And so God isn't telling us to give the whole world everything, but he will bring people to our hearts and says and say, you can give that there or you could do that there. And if he does, even if it's my last one, I can do that because I know that the Lord always provides my needs. So, you know, so that's the second thing. And the third thing is about the world. And I think look at it honestly look at it transparently say to the lord how do you see this world and i just read a scripture the other day and i've been making notes on it since then and it's the scripture in joshua i think it's about chapter seven where um they've come across the the jordan and now they're about to go into um jericho and they're about to go and fight jericho and joshua's gone for a walk and he suddenly sees this mighty being. And he's like, are you for us or are you for our enemy? And that being says, I'm not for either. I am the commander of the Lord's army and I have come. And I think that he probably came to see if the people would do what they were told, what they were going to then be told to do. So there was the instruction about walking around 13 times, you know, once each time for the first six days and then seven times on the last day and blow the trumpet and not speak and all of those things that they... So I felt that he was coming to, to see if that's what they would do. And if that is what they would do, he was going to bring the walls down and make them win. But he said, I'm not on either of your sides. Mm -hmm. What he meant was, I am here for those that are obedient to what the mm -hmm. Lord says. And so it seems to me that as Christians, it's very easy for us to get into a mindset and say the mindset is Christian. But actually, the only thing that's Christian is what is the Lord saying? What will I do? What is the Lord saying? And I look at Jesus and I see the way that Jesus cared for people and he didn't label them and he gave whatever he could give and he, he, did, he did what he did. And I look at some all of us we're we're all in this boat it doesn't matter what version of christianity we have we all sometimes baptize our belief system and um and we're not actually making sure that the lord is on our side because the that that mighty commander of the lord's army said i'm not on either of your sides even though israel was god's people he he says i'm not on either of your sides I'm, I'm just here and basically I'm here because if you obey, I'm going to be with you, which sort of means I wonder what would have happened if Jericho had obeyed, but Jericho clearly, you know, wasn't even asking God. So, so that's our answer. Our answer is firstly, be grateful what we've got rather than be guilty that we've got it. Secondly, to ask, to ask the Lord on behalf of our neighbours and if he says, and by the way, I know you've only got one roll of toilet paper left, but I want you to give it away. And then thirdly, praying for the world and our governments and our the context that we're in and maybe praying in tongues a lot, but asking God 
how will I show you in this? Not how will I show the church? Because there's always a church within the church. There's the church, which, yep, everybody loves God. And then within the church is the people who are saying, Lord, what are you saying? Because I want you to be on my side. So I'm going to obey whatever you tell me to say. And so do you get that? That's awesome. I took notes. Yeah. Great. That's good. I know a couple of people did. And I think I love your comment too about praying in the spirit, because honestly, I think uh, in this season, praying in the spirit is just like, it just, it, it brings me peace. Like almost like reading God's word does um, thinking the right things, uh, you know, thanking him, remembering the memorial stones, but actually uh, just praying in tongues, uh, praying in the, by the power of the spirit for five minutes. is just, I don't know, for some reason it's, it's just extra applicable or an extra powerful, uh, in these times. Um, so let me, uh, we got kind of one, one question. Somebody was asking about the difference between anxiety and, uh, fear. And if you were to, to try to, I mean, I've got my own thoughts on it, but um, what, what, how do you think that works? What's the difference between fear and anxiety or anxiousness? I don't think there's any difference. Mm -hmm. It's just got a, a more acceptable name. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and for me, I, so I was kind of thinking about it, and I had some, some time to think about it while you were talking uh, with, with the question, but it seems to me like fear is, Fear is like, hey, there is a bear three feet away from me right now, and I feel something like the fight or flight uh, kind of thing. Uh, and for me, anxiety is kind of like there isn't really a bear there, but there's like something there, and it's not here. It's not here with me right now, like in this room, three feet away from me. It's, it's probably out in uh, later on that day or tomorrow or something, just the kind of the possibility of running, uh, running into something. Maybe it's a bear, but some unnamed uh, thing like in the future. So I yeah. think when, when I, I think about those two things, it's like present and you can actually name the fear. And I think that in some way it may be a little bit easier because it's right in front of you. Uh, but I think anxiety might even be, you know, kind of the low grade fear that's kind of underneath the surface. And that's, it's maybe a little bit uh, harder or more process uh, oriented in terms of dealing with it because it's unnamed and it's, you know, it's just kind of out there. Uh, but certainly I think I agree like the, the effects on us are the same. It, it kind of wrecks the moment. It, it wrecks the, the today. It wrecks being present in, in what we're doing. So I, I feel that I, I really agree with what you said. For me, I'd say anxiety is there could be a bear out there. There is a bear or there could be a bear. But the father of anxiety is fear. Oh. You know, the father of perfectionism is fear. The father of all the words that we could use its father is fear. So it comes, like if you read, I don't know if you ever read that book by Hannah Hernard called um, Hind's Feet on High Places. It's a fantastic book to read, to understand about the way fear is just, um, wants to own us. It wants to own us. I read that off of, I stole it off of Julie's nightstand a few years ago. I read it. Parts of it as you was reading. It was, it was amazing. Can, uh, so can somebody type that, Julie, can you type that title of that book in the, in the comment section so everybody can take a peek at it and get it. And I also put in there, Speak Life and uh, Shut the Hell Up by Bev Merle. Um, yeah, I... I just, that, the thing that I want to say to everybody is it wants to own you. It wants to say who you are. It's stealing your identity. It's robbing your identity as the person that you were called to be. 
Because if you're afraid, you know, there's this, there's this really cool quote that I always love um, by somebody whose name I forgot now, but it is, it's hard to lead, it's hard to lead the charge in an army if you think you look funny sitting on a horse. And what it actually means is you might be called to lead the charge. You might be called as a great warrior. You might be called as a person who's, you know, going out to do bold, amazing things. But if the baseline is that you can't do any of it because you think that you look funny sitting on a horse and people will laugh at you, everything else won't get done. And so that's the point. We have to be comfortable with ourselves. We have to not let fear shape our identity. It doesn't mean go and do stupid things after that. It means hearing from God and responding to God. Always it means that. And the thing that um, Jeff said about praying in tongues, you know, just absolutely for that. But, and not but, not but at the end of that. That's the full stop. Then the new thought is, we are not born again perfect. We're born, we're born again and all our sins are forgiven. But, you know, you could be born again. And if you were racist and got brought up in a racist household, you'd still have to go ahead and find ways to firstly understand that racism is wrong and secondly to deal with it and thirdly sort of come out the other side. Or if you were brought up thinking that only people who had, you know, an intellect over an IQ over 120 were really valuable, um, you'd have to go through a process to realise everybody's made in the image of God. Or there's certain things that are just enculturized into who we are. You know, if you, if you were brought up in a home where everybody beating the daylights out of everybody else was acceptable, you'd have to go through a process. And so that's external things. Internally, our predisposition toward that unholy trinity, which is shame and fear and rejection, have to be beaten. And they're beaten one step at a time by the Lord putting his finger on one of those things and saying, I don't want you to do that anymore. And you thinking, okay. And, you know, when I was trying, I used to have really, really bad language, like very bad. And Rick used to say to me, you know, you don't, you know, you know Rick didn't think that was good. And when I became a Christian, I was focusing on stopping smoking. But while I was focusing on stopping smoking, the Lord was changing my language and stopping me swearing. And so bit by bit by bit, the Lord will deal, he'll just deal with the next thing and then he'll deal with the next thing and then he'll deal with the next thing. And all that's required of us to have our identity reshaped around who we're created to be in Christ is obeying each of those things and winning that little battle and then going on to the next one and letting who we are in Christ be our identity, not shame and fear and rejection. Awesome. Yeah, that's so, so good. So good. So let's, uh, uh, we're going to wrap it up. I hate to say it's been, time has flown by. It's been an hour and 15 minutes, 75 minutes. That's kind of the length of these Zoom talks. Uh, but, uh, I just want us to, Bev, I'd, I'd love for you to pray over, uh, the room here. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I used to think that, that the, the gathering, you know, had to be in person where we would gather and we could agree on any one thing and we would gather and you would be especially present. You'd be there. Um, but I'm actually thinking like, what other form the gathering takes, uh, not that it's ever going to be a substitute for coming together because we miss all you guys like crazy. It was so good to see people's faces today and come so close. Um, but just to see the smiles and ah, it was, it was delicious. So um, where, where am I going with this? So uh, yeah, but I'm, I'm thinking like even, when we gather, like we have gathered online, like in his, his name and according to his purposes. So I'm believing God's going to do something. We've had uh, requests for prayer and words of knowledge that have happened on our Sunday morning services. We've had people healed. I know the Gribbles uh, experienced uh, that. So yeah, Angela, her husband, Jeff, uh, she's the one with the beautiful pink 
uh, hair, but her husband. I'm cutting the hair. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> it's always a different color. Jeff never knows. Ah, uh, <laughs> never know. Uh, well, it was pink today. It was a little bit earlier. Oh, that Jeff. Yeah. Okay. Uh, there's Jeff. Cool. There's Jeff. Yeah. So yeah, yeah, he was sealed. Um, yeah, his foot. Yeah, my <laughs> foot sealed. It's, it really feels great. Yeah, and it's hurt for a long time. Yeah, it, uh, he has complained about it for like six to nine months. So <laughs> I'm like, let's let's pray for it. But I really didn't believe it would get healed, but it did. So even sometimes, when you, even when you don't believe, sometimes it, God does it. <laughs> there, you go. there you go. Cool. Thank you. Uh, so uh, without further ado. Uh, Bev, if you could pray, and I'm just going to put my hands out just because I'm, I like taking action steps. Uh, faith for me is always an action uh, more than it is a thought. And uh, just to receive, Bev, if you would pray over us, uh, that would be amazing. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for having me, guys. Father, in the name of Jesus, we all come to you together. We're all in the same boat, Lord, not one of us. Uh, didn't enter this world with already a predisposition to an unholy trinity of shame and fear and rejection that would want to rule our lives. And so, Father, we all are so grateful. We're, 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 words fail us to say how thankful we are that you provided a remedy and an antidote against that unholy thing when you sent your son, Jesus Christ, to die for us and pour out his blood all over us, Lord God, so that the consequences, the um, not the consequences, but the punishment for sin would be taken away from us and that every one of us can come to you and you see us clean and righteous and, Lord, that we will be able to walk into your throne room, Lord, looking like Jesus, just absolutely perfect. And yet, Lord, we also know that we're given this time on earth to uh, um, become more like you. And I know, Father, that because of the spirit over the world, fear wants to grip us. Fear wants to strangle us. Fear wants to stop the body of Christ from being effective and whole and holy in the world. Fear would want to uh, bring us down and, and make us unable to go forward like the guy that's supposed to be leading the charge but can't even get on the horse because he thinks he looks funny at, at that. And so, Father, in the name of Jesus, I take authority over the way that fear has desired to run our lives and rule our lives at little levels or at great levels or in between. I break the power of that fear. I break the power of that thing that would try to hold us down and say you will not be the body of Christ in this world that would say to us, it's okay for you to be Christian, but I'm not going to allow you to give out the purposes of God and the anointing of the Holy Spirit across this world. We break the power of that thing. And Lord, we thank you that your word says that the blood of Jesus Christ not only cleanses us from all sin, but Lord heals us and restores us and brings us into greater and greater measure of you so that we are being changed into your image from glory to glory. And so Father, I pray that you would give to every one of us the ability to discern the difference between being prepared and being afraid. Lord, that you would give every one of us the ability to discern the difference between um, operating on our own to keep ourselves safe and leaning on our own understanding and, um, and what it is to trust in you. Lord, that you would cause the discernment to come just like it did on Jeff in the supermarket when the spirit of fear that is running rampant across our world just tried to smear him. And Lord, that you rose up from the inside of him and you said, no, not that way, but this way. And so Father, I pray that you would give us discernment and that we would hear and that we would have the courage to obey when you say, no, not that way, but this way. Lord, when you say, I want you to deal with that, that we would have the courage to take the risks of everything changing because we are changing to obey you. And Father, that as that happens, that we would, self, we would see ourselves winning battle after battle. And Lord, even in the battles we lose, that we don't put ourselves down and we don't condemn ourselves because that comes from the enemy, but that 
if we would turn and say to you, I'm sorry, Lord, but what would you show me out of this? And Lord, in that, that that would be part of the learning process. Lord, that you would change our identity, that we would not get our picture of ourselves from what we're afraid of and what we're angry about and what we um, feel rejected by and what we're ashamed of. Lord, that those things would no longer be able to give us our identity, but Lord, that line upon line and precept upon precept and here a little, there a little, you will begin to cause us to slough off those old things that are not who we are and that have just attached themselves to us by the sin in the world. And Lord, that we would become increasingly like you, that our identity would be that I am a child of God, that I am not motivated by fear, that I am not motivated by rejection, that I am not motivated by shame and that I am not going to give other more socially acceptable names to fear and shame and rejection but i'm going to name it for what it is i'm going to repent of it for what it is and i'm going to say to you lord i trust in you with all my heart help me not lean on my own understanding help me just keep remembering to acknowledge you in every single decision i have to make and know that you're directing my path so i don't have to be afraid lord i pray for revelation of the mighty power of God to give us our identity and give us the power to be able to deal with fear and tell it to, to leave our lives. And Lord, that we would find our lives changing so that Lord, as we go further and further down the track, we will see that we are no longer in hand-to-hand -hand combat with the enemy because we see him coming over the hill like Jeff did in the supermarket and we're able to deal with it at that point and that there is really no strong battle. It's just a, a little skirmish that we've been able to come through. Father, I pray for revelation on New Song. Lord, that there will be revelation on New Song, that they would exhibit the astonishing power of a people who hear from God and obey him so that when the commander of the Lord's army has to work out who he's going to stand with, he's going to stand with us. Lord, let it be unto us, according to your word, I pray, that fear and shame and rejection no longer direct our lives, but you direct our lives and that we are free to walk in courage and in strength and in total acceptance of who we are as your child. Lord, let it be unto us, according to your word, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you for that. I feel fortified. Thank you. That's good, yeah. And and I just feel like uh, there's somebody that, that's thinking the thing that we deal with sometimes is like, hey, um, yeah, there's for somebody that's going to take some risk and, 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 and there's going to be some overcoming moments, I, I believe life is going to get better. Uh, life is going to, well, not better. Life is going to get bigger. Life is going to get bigger. God is... That's his desire. That's his plan for our lives. That it would, that we would grow. It would become larger. It would become fuller. It would become more powerful, and uh, that is going to uh, happen. So, all right. Well, uh, thanks. We're going to go ahead. We've got this recorded. We're going to try to put it up on Facebook. And uh, a week from Thursday, we have uh, the Odells uh, that are going to be here, and they're going to be talking about finances. Uh, and uh, this Saturday, for the guys, we have Rick Cromlich, a retired Rear Admiral for the Coast Guard, talking, us, talking to us about making quality, the art of making quality decisions under pressure. And yes, ladies, it'll be recorded. It'll be on Facebook. We're going to attempt to do all that. But Bev, we are just so honored and, and humbled. So good to hear your voice. And uh, I, can, I can feel just some things being... Uh, broken and uh, I can hardly wait till we are together again and if that uh, yeah and including you we want to see you on this continent singing with that loud beautiful uh, joyful voice uh, yes and uh, declaring life uh, over us and convincing us uh, that we're supposed to speak life so we're going to go ahead and end the meeting. And if you guys want to, if you guys are Bev's friends on Facebook or something, you can send her a, an encouragement, something that she spoke that, that blessed you and uh, stay in contact. And uh, we'll see, men, we'll see you on Saturday. And 
uh, for everybody else, we'll see you next uh, Thursday night for our next Zoom class. Bless you guys. Bye. I'm honored. Thank you. Bye. Have a good evening, guys. I'm going to have a good day. Bye.